Hey, this is your Olympic hero, Kurt Angle, and I don't suck, and neither does the Pipples podcast, but anyone who plays the Riders, they suck. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. Let's go, Rider Nation. I'm ready. Welcome into the Piffles Podcast, your Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan podcast, episode 248. I'm excited for Grey Cup, you guys. How are you guys feeling this week? Serious case of FOMO right now. Yeah. Serious case. Uh, great Grey Cup? What What is this thing you speak of? <laughs> um, we'll see it eventually again, right? Uh, right all, all i all i know is i'm abw screw abc i'm abw anyone but winnipeg <laughs> yeah i think everybody yeah. outside of winnipeg is abw well yeah you see if you're watching on uh, youtube or sastel max tv on demand i got my montreal alouettes hat on uh they got my full support i want to see cody mustache fajardo win that gray cup <laughs> um i'm going to talk about his mustache later on because i absolutely love it um i must ask a few questions we're already going that route those Steve yes. is already this might be a record like 30 seconds in and Steve is already face palming. Yes. This is great. Oh, Off to a great God. start here. <laughs> I should well, be in got, Hamilton right now. This sucks. <laughs> you got Alex, Steve and Greg here. You can give us a follow on Twitter. I'm at or X. Sorry. At real Alex D. You can find me at Safamod. And as always, I do not need nor want your pity follows at Greg on sports. Follow the Piffles account at Piffles Pod. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash Piffles Podcast. Okay, we got so much to do. Let's get to it right away here. Piffles Podcast, of course, brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. Time for the opening kickoff. <laughs> And just like that, we have somebody joining us here for the opening kickoff, Daniela Ponticelli, of course, uh, working the Riders pre- and post-game show, sideline reporter for 620 CKRM. Daniela, thanks for joining us here on the Piffles Podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I really love that I can still be talking Riders, even though the season ended a couple weeks ago, which seems wild to me, but here we are, and... Uh, I can't wait to talk great cup with all of you because I have a little bit of a bone to pick about the Montreal underdog love, but maybe I'll understand it once you tell me more. Okay. Well, we'll get into that. Well, but we brought you on here. We're going to start talking. We, we are going to talk riders because there is some rider news. Yep. There's some good and some Absolutely. bad. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that. We'll talk uh, about the, the East and West finals. And uh, I think we have, uh, I think everybody kind of wants to ask you some questions here, Daniela about. Okay, uh, sure you going forward. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, But let's start with the rider talk here. Um, Good stuff. uh, Jorgen Hughes resigning for two years. That was just announced. And I know a lot of people when they hear a long snapper, uh, their name, first first impression is who? And to me, that's a good thing. (laughs) If you don't know the long snapper's name, that's a great thing. And uh, I mean... This guy can be a rider for as long as he wants to be. He's great at his craft, never makes a mistake. And I'm excited for this signing. It's a very underrated signing. What do you guys think? I'd like to jump in right away if that's all right, because I'm a big fan of Mr. Hughes. Because not only because he's been so rock steady, he has not missed a single game in the new stadium. And that's incredible. I mean, you expect it from a position like that, you know, that is likely that you could do that. However, he has done it, right? Not everyone has. And so he's the longest serving member right now of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And it's great to see that he's added on two more years. All round good guy, has great chemistry on special teams with the kicking unit. And that's kind of what you need when you consider how quickly, uh, you know, the Australian kicker jumped right in and he was great. He was 100% the game that he played and he flew in that morning. So part of that is certainly kudos to the team that's snapping and holding. Like I put on X today, like you you don't know how important a long snapper is until you don't have one. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think a few years ago, back when we had uh, 
Saskatchewan Rough Rider great Randy Chevrier. Um, obviously Chevrier, but that spelling mistake never die, never goes well. <laughs> but it's just like we had to sign him on a, like, basically a one day contract because we had no long snapper. Like long snapper is a precise position that does not get enough respect at any level because, like I said, if you don't have one. Your, your kicking game is completely out the window, punting and uh, field goal. And you, you take the football side of it away. He's also a great guy in the community. He's one of those guys that's out and about all off season. Great name out there. Totally good all around dude and amazing at what he does on the field. I never thought the day would come where I'd be excited for a long snapper signing. <laughs> but honestly, I think I'm turning into a little bit of uh, Mark Fulton out of Hamilton. And I, I got a lot of love for the long snapper position because we've been incredibly blessed since he showed up. And I will say that there is one thing left on his bingo card that he really wants to get as a rider because he got the fumble recovery. It took him eight years, but he got a fumble recovery. He wants to do the scoop and score. That's what he told me this season. So he's just waiting. I think he's going to want to hang on until he gets that. Hopefully he gets it right away, but uh, he'd love to get that. He told me. Okay. Well, you talk to the players. Uh, you're around them quite a bit with your, uh, with your job, with the, with the team. What is, what is he like? Um, we we do like Steve said. We see all the community stuff. What's something about him that you know we may not know? It's it's one of those things where he's one of those quiet guys as it is, but you can tell that he is always got a positive aura around him. People enjoy being around him, and he's got really close friends, which makes sense, right? When you're part of that unit, and it's maybe a little bit different than other positions. Uh, but he is so tight with guys like Brett Lawther. We don't know, of course, the future for Brett with the Riders yet. But because uh, he could be a pending free agent, we'll see what happens. But honestly, it's it's uh, I just get such a great vibe from him. And there's never obviously there's never any drama around this guy. <laughs> and as we know, that can be a big benefit in a team that you're trying to build culture with. Right. And he's kind of been through it all with this team. He's from Saskatoon. So I love this as well. that he gets to stay close to home and he fully appreciates the fact that he gets to play in his home province and it shows with everyone who comes to watch him every game. Well, the Riders go from 37 potential free agents from when the list came out. Now they're down to 34 um, with Jorgen Hughes resigning uh, because they released one of them. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit of the bad stuff that came out this past week. Uh, Nick Marshall um, arrested on gun possession charge in Georgia. Georgia on It was announced on uh, a Sunday, as I think, uh, when it all kind of came out on social media. It happened late last week. Um, Jeremy O'Day acting quickly on Monday, releasing him. Um, to me, just with how the last couple of years have gone, the PR for the team, pending free agent, just it makes it that much easier for him. Um, obviously, I think this was just the the right thing to do if you're the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I don't see any other way around it. Last thing they need is another not even a Marino situation, but a situation where a story is going to build and build and build until he was gone. And yes, he was going to be a pending free agent. There was no guarantee they were bringing him back, especially with his boom and bust capabilities. I know we've talked a few times about maybe it's time to move on from Nick Marshall, but this, it made the most sense just to cut ties. And he, if he gets signed, he gets signed, but his time as a rider was up. I, I don't think there's any surprise, really. When you look at the last few years, the thing this team needed more than anything this offseason is a complete culture shift. They need to get that locker room back. They need to get that that good look in the community back. And as soon as a guy gets charged with fairly serious charges out of, out of Georgia, if it's somebody that's even on the cusp at this point, which I think we all agree he was, they didn't really have a choice. And I think acting quickly really sets the tone for where I hope this team goes in the offseason with that culture change and with that that attitude change and, you know, really rebuilding that locker room and, you know, heading towards hopefully a very positive 2024. Yeah, I think the only thing I want to add to that is my own personal reaction to it was just that it was a very sad situation for the people involved. You know, obviously consequences will have to be doled out. 
you have to face the music when these uh, situations arise. I fully support the team's decision. It's not even just a PR thing. This is truly, I, I couldn't imagine the team and the club going about this in any different way, uh, given the, the staff that they have. I can, this decision, it just made sense, but still it's just a sad, sad situation when you think of what that person's going through and maybe I'm just feeling a little extra sensitive because it's, you know, two tough years on, on the football field. So outside of that, no one knows what's going on, right? No one knows what's happening in people's lives. So I respect that decisions have to be made. Consequences will certainly be faced. Um, but it's just, I just felt overall, overall pretty sad about the situation. Well, it, and it is a guy that who, you look on the field. He has absolutely given his all to the team on and off the field in his time with Saskatchewan. So you, you hate to see it go down like this. He deserved a better, a far more fitting farewell to Saskatchewan. And it is, and it is a tough situation from that point of view as well. I, I agree. It's just, it's not a great situation all around. Yeah. You hope it works out for him. You hope that, you know, thing, things turn into a positive direction. For sure. And that's exactly it. I'm not here to defend anyone's actions by any stretch of the imagination. But, uh, you know, once things are settled and his life is his own, where he's no longer tied to this club, you know, all you can hope for is that there's there's a positive outcome in the future. Because obviously something drives someone to behave in that way. And nobody really knows what it is unless you're living it. So that's all I want to say on that matter. Cause obviously lots of people online just want to add in like name, name calling in those situations and things like that. And you know, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Social media <laughs> is the forum for gentle conversation <laughs> and good co and good uh, ideas. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes. How could I forget? <laughs> I will not have you slander the great platform known as X. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. You'll save that for me. I'll do that later. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, the East and West finals last week, I think uh, we can all say we were surprised by the outcome in the East final. Um, not necessarily that Montreal won. It's how they won with all the turnovers from Toronto. Nine turnovers, two pick sixes. Uh, Chad Kelly who's been absolutely fantastic for, you know, 17 games this season. That was the one game that he had a bad game. And I actually, I feel sorry for Chad Kelly because everybody's absolutely just ripping him right now saying that was mm -hmm. not a most outstanding performance. That was just brutal. And this guy's a bum and blah, blah, blah. I've seen whole, all these comments and I feel bad for him because the guy just finished his first full season in the CFL as a, a starter. And to do what he did this year was absolutely incredible. We've only seen one other team go 16 and two and he had one bad game and everyone's going to pick on him for it. Look at Vernon Adams. He had one really bad game earlier this year. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody remembers that. And it's going to be how he bounces back from this next season. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Greg remembers everything. Greg keeps receipts on absolutely everything. You're so right, though, Alex. It's all about when you have your bad game. And for Vernon Adams, it was early on in the season against the Argos. But I digress. Yeah, Swag picked a bad week to have a become Chad. It was a it was a bad game for him. Uh, like this team, like there was people saying God himself couldn't uh, be the quarterback of the Alouettes to lead him to victory. Jeff Fairholm on this show said there was no way that the Argos weren't going to the Grey Cup. Well, that's why you play the game. M Montreal came in and had a plan, and Toronto just had their worst game at the worst possible time. There, there's yeah, two. I will... mm -hmm. Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going <laughs> to jump on the fact that anyone who ever makes – bold statements like that that's always a slippery slope and it's not about superstition or anything like that it's exactly as you say that's why we play the game i know a few teams in saskatchewan that have had undefeated regular seasons and they can't make it into they they can't get the championship right it's just it's a different obstacle and when a team has time to prepare and it, it's a complete even footing in my opinion when it comes to playoffs and 
Yeah. I mean, Montreal, it was like, as soon as De, De Croix got that pick six, it was, and that was at the opening on the opening drive, right? Changed the game. It was Changed like, the entire game. Yep. Absolutely. It's like the air got sucked out. So it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. And I agree that like, at the very least, you would have wanted to see those two teams keep it close and keep it just a battle throughout the entire time. And then there was a little bit of a momentum change. And of course, then it wasn't. So it was, uh, it was hard to see, but Montreal was the better team. And that's the, where the frustrating football... part to me has to be the fact that they finally get this large crowd out in Toronto, 26, yep. 27,000, however many people they had. And I've been one of those who I'm very pro Toronto crowd. If you ever get the chance to go to a game in Toronto, it's loud as hell in there. Very like loud. The, like the, the acoustics. That's if, just the way it is. Yeah. If they can ever fill that barn out, it will be the loudest stadium in the CFL. And like Winnipeg, it will be stadium assisted because of the metal bench. Thank you. But Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome, Greg. <laughs> I'm not but, wading uh, into that debate. <laughs> but but the, the fans were there and they hopefully saw some positives from that because what they need to build on is that 26,000 and bring a yeah. bunch of them back. But on the flip side, you have a guy like Chad Kelly who really said and did all the right things, especially in the second half of the season. You know, he signed his three-year deal. He's pushed his career to the CFL after a lot of talk about going south. And to have that happen, just it's kind of tough for him as from a professional level. You almost feel for the guy because you want to see him have that success because a successful team in Toronto is the best thing for this league right now. It is the thing that will help this league grow into the future again. I mean, the good thing is they are successful. They're doing exactly. I I encourage everybody to rewatch Ryan Dinwiddie's introductory coaches conference, everything that pinball and Dinwiddie laid out. It's all there. And it's an MLSC as well in terms of what they wanted. Right. And we've heard sustained success. We've heard that before that nice little fancy term. That is actually what they're doing here. So they didn't make it to the Grey Cup. They had they were hosted the Eastern Final again. They're constantly showing up. They had the best season in 150 years. So I will say, like, it's important to keep perspective on that, even though, of course, it was would have been the absolute, absolute cherry on top for them to go to the big game so that they can kind of defend, well, defend their title, but also defend this idea that they are the best Argos team in history. But that's one of the nice, one of the both the best things and the worst things about football in the playoffs. It's a one game series. Anything could happen. It doesn't matter what your record is at that point. It's who who has the better team that day. And let's let's be honest. Montreal came in with a plan, and they succeeded on what they needed to get done. And as as great as it would have been to see the Argos punch Winnipeg in the throat again. I got to hope Montreal does it this week. Uh, well, Montreal and Danielle, you, you mentioned uh, <laughs> Mark Antoine Decroix and his pick six. Yeah. I just want to say really quick that I he's becoming one of my favorite players in this league. He is an absolute beast on the field. I love watching him play. And maybe one day we can pry him away from Montreal. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, he's, he's talented. He showed up every damn week. It's pretty impressive. But on the other side of the ball, it wasn't so much the the Montreal offense. They did enough um, to to get by. Um, I'm happy for Jason Moss and Cody Fajardo. I said before that I think it would just be great chaos. I'd love to see them get to the Grey Cup and win it, just see people lose their minds. Um, but I'm actually really excited to or for these guys getting to the Grey Cup. Um, Fajardo especially. Um because that just means we get to see more of his mustache all week long. We get the <laughs> Pajaro mustache. And a couple of weeks ago when he first started growing it, I was like, this is terrible. And now that it's starting to come in, I absolutely love it. And I just want to see more of it. Does it have a nickname yet? Have you named it? I have not. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's, that's my place to name his mustache. Uh, fair, 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 fair. If Jason Moss had one, it would be a mustache. Oh, yes. that's good. What about just the corn dog? Like it's kind of sitting like one a little bit. No. <laughs> Listen, I think it's great. He's found his own identity. He's found his own groove. And I had a I had a good feeling about him getting out of 
Saskatchewan. Not that I imagined he would go to the Great Cup. That was, but I figured he would have some sort of a coming into his own situation just because I don't, he wasn't comfortable here. Obviously at the end of everything, that's the most hot take you'll hear. He wasn't comfortable, but it's true. He wasn't, you could tell there was this discomfort of where he was at. And sometimes all it takes is a shift in environment, a shift in where you are. And it's a healthy change for him. He still got sacked like crazy this season. Um, And even in that game, like I think it's wild that he got sacked seven times. Didn't matter. Because, of course, the turnovers were so heavily against Toronto. But, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, he's a tough dude. He takes his lumps. He'll take his time. And he's, he's shown that he can win games. And that's all you have to do, especially once you get to the playoffs, right? We just really have to hope he can do that one thing that has haunted him through most of his career. And that is beat Winnipeg in a big game. Because I think everybody nationwide, with the exception of Winnipeg, is on the Montreal bandwagon. There's not a lot of hate for the Alouettes fan base. <laughs> oh, what, what, what? No. <laughs> Why is there a giant forehead? Like that's not that's that's a, like a five head in the picture right now. If you say apparently, if you say the Alouettes three times, uh, an Argos fan will appear. <laughs> I'll take you my chance with say Bloody I. Mary. <laughs> is he intercepting your interview, or would that be an Alouette's thing to do? Oh, Ooh. sorry, Adam. I was cheering for the the Argos all the way. I'm sorry. A lot of talk for a guy who's not going to Grey Cup and can get away with <laughs> saying that right now. <laughs> Just, Just right? throwing Just bombs from Regina to Toronto. <laughs> um, I can get away with it from here. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. The, a little bit the of change, an inside the change of scenery. The change of scenery for Cody Fajardo obviously was was right for both parties at the time and it still is obviously and to see him getting that next step in his career is is great um and jason moss as well too uh has a ring as a as a player would be kind of cool to see him get one as a coach as well uh going up against mike o'shea uh who he has enough rings he doesn't need any more so yeah we're we're all on now, the uh, would you feel that way if it was the writers? No, of course was... not. Of not. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Do, do, do you know what show you're on? Just, like, yeah. As long as we could just be very, very clear. Oh, yeah. About that. Okay. Winnipeg right now, and Greg, you're gonna hate this uh because you're a New England Patriots fan. They're the mm-hmm. New England Patriots of the CFL, and people hate them because they ain't them. Um, and the, and it's the success that they're having. Everybody wants that success, everybody wants their team to be hated by every other fan base because they're winning so damn much. I wish that happened here. Look, well, I mean, it kind of did in from 07 to 13 where everybody, yeah. I mean, everybody still piles on the riders whenever they get a chance to, um, but people really, really hated the team then. And but, but they, really, were, they between, were getting the great cups. Between 89 and 07 though, we were the lovable losers. I hated that. We were everyone's favorite, second favorite team uh, because, yeah. oh, the riders, they're trying hard. They're doing yeah. nine and nine and they're, they, they might win a playoff game. <laughs> I yeah. hate that. No, like hate us or just leave us alone. Like I'm done with it. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's, that's, that's some good perspective. Um, but the bombers, um, I mean, they beat the lions in the, in the West final, it was an 11 point game, but that game really wasn't that close. BC outside of a hail Mary at the end of the first half, um, absolutely dominated that game. And their, their ground game got going Brady Oliveira or like dominated the first quarter. Um, but it looked to me like Winnipeg was trying to hide Zach Kalaros. Did you guys get that impression mm-hmm. of that game? No, but in fairness, I, I didn't get the chance to watch the game. I was stuck listening to it on the radio. Uh, so there, I didn't get that sense. It didn't come across, at least, through uh, through the Lions' play-by-play. It, to me, the biggest key from that game was the fact that Bernard Adams was hurt. And it came out afterwards. It was his MCL, I believe. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think I read somewhere. Uh, and as a mobile quarterback, you lose your knee at, in the biggest game of the year against a defensive line-like winnipegs that is not a recipe for success i mean we look at again we go back to cody Fajardo. near the end of the last season he was playing hurt and it and it unfortunately showed this is actually most of last thing. season yeah yeah, yeah he, i guess it was almost all all season he was injured but that's 
that's not a recipe for success against a, a team, a defense like Winnipeg. Yeah, I agree. I I I will admit I had the game on and I was sort of loosely watching it in a haze because I was getting ready for Grey Cup and kind of was a little bit just feeling the vibes of oh everything is done for me and my work, right? So it was just a different kind of perspective. So I watched the the game a little bit in the background, uh, you know, Winnipeg. I, I but I agree with the sentiment uh Steve that you said like it's um uh, they were they were they were out there doing their thing, and it didn't seem too much like they were necessarily hiding Zach. They were just, I think they were just trying to take the, the path of least resistance. <laughs> if you got Brady Oliveira and you're not using him for half the game, you're doing it wrong. He's, he's an absolute yeah. beast. And there's another guy that if we could pry him away from Winnipeg. Uh, yes, please. We gave you guys Willie Jefferson. You can give us Brady Oliveira. It's a fair trade, <laughs> I think. Knowing full well that'll never happen. No, no. No, yeah, he's a bummer for life if they're smart. <laughs> then again, I said the same thing about uh, my buddy, old Andrew Harris there, but uh, he's he's obviously finished his uh, career as an Argo by the sounds of it. So, so Grey Cup coming up on Sunday. We'll get to our official picks. Uh, Daniel, I don't, are, are you sticking around for the whole show? Or do you got to duck out here? I will need to duck out. Okay. So uh, really quick, what's your uh, prediction for the Grey Cup, Montreal and uh, Winnipeg? I'm, don't hate me. I know you're going to hate me because you hate me, but I'm going with Winnipeg. I see them. I see them doing it. They weren't able to get it done last year, but I see them coming through this year. And not because I think Montreal is a weak team. Not at all. I think Montreal will actually make it really interesting. I'm kind of hoping for the same sort of back and forth volley that they had with Toronto last year. I mean, that was just a fun game to watch, but uh, I, I think Winnipeg still has um, not only the personnel to do it, but uh, the coaching, everything, right? Like not only the players, but the coaches as well who are just dialed in. Now without Adam, Adam Big Hill being out, that's a huge blow. Like there are certainly considerations to be made, but I'm going to go with Winnipeg in Hamilton. All right. Well, like I said, we'll get our picks uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but Daniela, before you duck out, we do have some yep. questions for you. Okay, um, bring it on. <laughs> so you announced in uh, or last it was was it this month or in October? It was the Riders. It was the Riders' last game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, October. It would have been October twenty first. Oh, yeah, I was in the, I was in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, you were getting your call. Wait, does everybody know? Yeah, yes, yes, we've talked about Okay. <laughs> Can I talk about the, the gallbladder? Yeah, the uh, gallbladder's gone. <laughs> yeah. It's gone. We're, we're out of the How playoffs podcast now. We don't need to do the upper <laughs> yeah. body, lower body thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are you with eggs, Greg? Are you doing okay? <laughs> uh, eggs? Sure, why not? I don't okay. know. Just because I know somebody else who doesn't have a gallbladder and eggs are their kryptonite, so. I haven't might tried be yet, in the room. so thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> just a warning be close to a bathroom um so daniela you finish your your job with the riders doing pre and post game shows on 620 ck i'm working the sideline reporters i'm assuming done hosting the air it out podcast the riders podcast not entirely i'm glad you brought that up so we were going to do a, another episode actually coming out this week great cup week and realize that might be there might be a lot going on this week so we decided that the at least the sort of final episode as we know it possibly to be extended but final episode as we know it will be with the new head coach whenever that is announced so that'll be really exciting um and we're sort of keeping that uh we're just keeping that as as a future Whenever that happens, I, I have no idea. This is not a, an inside scoop at all. <laughs> They're just I was like, going to say, so Scott, when is Scott available? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no idea. No idea who, no idea what, anything. I just was told, hey, we're going to hold off. And whenever that, that head coaching announcement comes, it'll be in the days after whenever that is. So I'm glad you asked because that was something that we obviously didn't quite get to, to make an announcement on. But that's uh, pretty exciting stuff. When you get the chance, tell Scott we say hi. Stop and, uh, it. <laughs> St I'm going to get in trouble here. I am not spreading any rumors. I'm just telling you that. Air it out. A Saskatchewan Rough Rider podcast. Has Sniffle news. Episodes. Danielle Poncelli, you confirm Scott Milanovic, head coach. <laughs> <sighs> yep. She has said nothing. <laughs> nothing. Zip. 
I shouldn't have um, even said head coach with a new member of the coaching <laughs> yeah. staff. <laughs> I don't know who. Don't know who. Don't know gender. Don't know age. Could be a baby. I have no idea. We'll see. <laughs> it, it, it's an idea. It, it might not even be a person. It's an idea. Yeah. Could coach. be a dog. I've put yeah. Maggie's name forward for consideration. So you just oh, Maggie's never got know. my support. Absolutely. <laughs> If if you're if you're a player and you don't follow behind a dog, you don't belong on this team. <laughs> but can I'm a dog so clap? Can a dog clap? Yep. Yeah, we will literally <laughs> run through the wall for that dog. Um, oh my so, gosh, off the rails. <laughs> so you, you obviously haven't listened to us before. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but Danielle, over the last couple of years working for the team doing the pre and post game shows, listening to hundreds of fans calling in, especially over the last couple of years with how frustrated fans have been. Yeah. What's your overall take on the riders the last couple of seasons, just with starting out pretty good and then just two back-to-back -back years of seven straight losses and just, it just all just fallen apart. Oh, that's a big question to ask. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to try to maybe do this through the lens of the fans because the fans really tell the arc of the season, right? There's always there's always a little base layer of optimism and then it just sort of starts to slowly run out. Actually, sometimes not very slowly. Sometimes like week two or three, that optimism starts to run dry. But the biggest thing is there's always this overwhelming love for the team. And and I get that sense across the board. I'm, I'm not going to speak ill of the club because I've only had positive experiences behind the scenes. I'll just lay that all out there. It's been nothing but positive. It's been amazing. But when there are losses, it hurts everybody. Every It's felt by everybody. And when those start to stretch and stretch and stretch, it just becomes a question of, yeah, what are we doing wrong? What is happening? And clearly other teams were improving while the riders were regressing. And at the end of the day, you know, you can blame whoever you want to blame, but it's, it's a multitude of, of factors that, that played into that. So I think overall, it's a matter of us getting on track, but hopefully as a fan base, also sort of wrapping that all in as much optimism and positivity. I know that sounds might sound hokey to you, but there is such a thing as like, if all you're putting out there is bad energy, that's what you're going to get back. So maybe it's time to like, take a little piece of, okay, whoever is the next person to step into that role, whoever is that, that next thing, let's see what we can do. And I know there's going to be rider fans that say, Hey, I'm always positive. That's true. There are some that are genuinely always like up here, like the team's going to win. There were still people telling me when it was three games left in the season, Nope, they're going to, they're going to win out for the rest of the season. And I'm like, I'd love for that to be true. I don't want that not to be true. But you also have to be a bit of a realist sometimes. So I I didn't quite answer your question, but I think overall there's certainly something to be said about the fact that once the team was getting figured out, there was no way they could never quite raise the bar above that. So ho hopefully the changes that are coming this upcoming season will, will, will deal with that. And of course, the biggest thing is on the sideline. You could always see when the, the energy sort of went out the window and that was super sad, right? Like that wasn't, that was no fun to kind of see that. And then I felt like October 21st really could have gone the rider's way. I really do believe that there was, there was an energy and a vibrancy to the fact it was the final game of the season at home, a lot on the line. And then the Argos took it away, but everything comes full circle. Cause I also think about the fact, sorry, I'm going all over the place here. I also think about the fact that uh, the Argos clinched uh, the, number one in the east over montreal in week 15 so and then montreal's like oh whatever right because at the end of the day it's it's what happens in the playoffs hopefully getting to the playoffs now you mentioned positivity i'm really glad you brought that up as somebody who uh spends <laughs> a lot of friday saturday nights on the road i listen to a lot of the pre and or the a lot of the post game show and i was really impressed with your ability especially late in the season somehow managing to keep things on the post game show relatively positive. I mean, we're in the midst of our second consecutive seven game losing streak to end the season yet. We didn't know that at actually, the time. Right? <laughs> but, but you could feel, you could feel it sliding. And somehow when people called in, it was mostly happy. There wasn't a lot of those angry calls. There were still some, there's always going to be some, yeah. but it felt like there was a, almost a, a positive attitude to Rider nation 
through that show. And it, it just, I just wanted to say that as a regular listener, that impressed me that you could keep people, you know, keep those hopes up. Cause I mean, rider math is all we had growing up like, that you need those three wins plus these losses and oh, you know, somebody know. has to trip over a crack to win. That That's what we grew up on. And that's hard, and, right? Yeah, <laughs> it no, is. I, it, to keep that was was something else. Yeah. How do you well, thank, do that? Thank you for saying that. I don't know. I think it was just overall that, you know, Don, Wes, and I, we all enjoyed being there. We never once, you know, went into that show being like, oh, we have to do this. Bleh. Like, we loved being there. And so it was just a matter of like, okay, we're all in this together. It was the greatest debrief of all time. And I also find that a lot of, um callers sort of realize like hey i can i can vent i can be upset like we would have some callers just straight up vent but there's also going to be you know whether it's one of one of the co-hosts sort of challenging or asking like a different viewpoint like what do you think of this and i it's just kind of the way that things naturally evolved and i do think that when you come from that place of, of positivity and just gratitude that we all get to hang out and talk football when there's so many other things going on in our world not to like bring all of that into it but that is always a really humbling part of it right it's like yes let's all be a little bit sad and upset that our team is not doing well while also remembering like this can be fun and we can we can talk about things um one thing i will say and and i really respect this from our our listeners is that a lot of them um there's there's there were no personal attacks on coaches and players and and that was something that we were really mindful of we just wanted to make sure it was about the players, or sorry, about about the game, about the team. You can critique players. There's a big difference between critiquing a player and critiquing what's happening versus, as I was talking sort of about the Nick Marshall situation, you know, versus just name calling or, or, or being really personal about it. And so big kudos to, to the fans who called in. And maybe that turns some people away, but the biggest thing is that it's the Rider Nation is such a vast, vast vast community and i love that we had callers from all over the world and then the people who did call in regularly kind of knew you know like they knew what they would want to say knew what they wanted to share and it was always appreciated all right now daniela article came out we have you on yeah while we have you on (laughs) article came out paul woods uh out in toronto yeah uh, did an article on you and Adam. Um, not to regurgitate the entire story, but how <laughs> tough was it to open up to someone uh, to, I mean, Paul's done some great stuff, especially in the CFL great as well, writer. too. Great writer. Um, a very private thing. How difficult was it to open up to someone that you may not know all that well when it is a private thing about you you know, meeting Adam and then now moving to Toronto. Yeah. And, and his relationship prior and on all of that, that, that kind of fills out the story. Um, it took us, I, I posted about it on Facebook that it took us a while to come to that consensus, not because I didn't trust Paul or didn't think he'd be amazing. Um, but just because I'm not usually the person being interviewed. And so it was just a very, yeah, very vulnerable thing. And then we had a conversation with Paul separate to an, an actual conversation. Cause Paul was the one who came to us and asked like about it. And so he said, okay, like, what do we have to lose? Right? Like when you think about it, it's, it's you know, someone's interested in telling our story, which to us is just our lives. And, um, and so we went for it and I'm like, okay, I mean, Paul knows what he's doing. <laughs> like maybe it was, if it was someone else, maybe I'd feel a little differently. We didn't know where it would be published, if it would be published because uh, Paul does some freelance stuff. And sure enough, um, yeah, it was in Toronto Star, which was a surprise. And uh, it's been nothing but amazing feedback from people who've gone through similar things, who've dealt with similar things, uh, especially people who connect really, really strongly with Adam's story and what what he's gone through. And I think that has been the greatest gift through all of that. But yeah, it is difficult always to open up, but then I always ask people to do that with me. So I should, (laughs) I should probably pay it, pay it back a little bit too. Right. I always like dig in and get kind of, Hey, so we're going to talk about this uncomfortable thing. Um, I've gotten apparently really good at that, but I usually give people a heads up. And the, the good thing with Paul is that we knew full well what we would be talking about. So nothing was a surprise or, 
caught us off guard. It was, we're, we're going to talk about your story and here we are. Yeah. So going to Toronto, <laughs> what's next for Daniela Ponticelli? Are we going to see some sort of CFL thing related oh. going on? Wow. I mean, I, I, I I'll put it out really... there right now publicly. I'd love to keep working with the CFL. I'll just put that out there. Uh, no, it, it, at this point in time, it's still a matter of chatting with people, figuring out what my next step is, are, you know, all that sort of thing. I love this league. I'm going to be involved in it somehow, some way, whether it's just as fan, which I'm honestly, I love as well, right? And I haven't been able to do that uh, for, for a couple of years, which is okay, because it's also amazing to be on the other side of it all. So that's all right, too. But um, basically, I think the last time I went to a Ryder game as a fan was 2018, 2018. Not that long ago, but long enough. Um, where you can actually cheer and have a drink and whatever, have a good time. Not that it's not fun doing my job. <laughs> I'm just backpedaling. <laughs> like, I love doing my job, but it's just different, right? You're just, like, so intense and everything is, like, one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, so, love the CFL. Hope to Hope to be involved with it in the future somehow some way um and then the rest is genuinely wait and see because there's things happening wheels turning and i don't even quite know the direction that they're going in so <laughs> we'll leave it at that and i'm not trying to be cryptic <laughs> for the sake of it yeah hey we already got you on the record saying scott milanovich is the head coach <laughs> no, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Never coming on the show again. <laughs> we get that a lot. <laughs> yeah, everybody says, yeah, yeah, everybody says that. They're so excited to join the show, and then uh, they never never answer our phone call. You want to know who put in a great word for all three of you? It was Mr. Jeff Fairholm. So he had a great time doing the show. Well, of so. course, and Jeff Steve wasn't here. because yeah, yeah, Steve, Steve wasn't, wasn't here. here. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Okay, so two that of makes you. Sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do believe yeah. Jeff was also our first, second, second time guest, wasn't he? Oh wow! Oh, no, we've had we've had the commissioner a couple of times. We've had no, yeah. we've had commissioners. Um, I'm pretty sure we had uh, Chunky was on a couple of times. Marcus Adams, um, Derek Dennis. There's times. been a few. Yeah, there's been a few. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess there has been. So what you're trying to say is maybe if I play my cards right, I can <laughs> pop in as a second time guest. Yeah. I will take it. I will we'll need the five yeah. timers uh, jacket. You know, <laughs> like start starting life. You get a yeah. button every time. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Well, thank you they're, they're for all... inviting me on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting me on. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Like I said, it's it's kind of fun to talk writers, even though. Our season is done. There's the, this is going to get exciting. The next however many weeks, months, whatever is ahead. Well, we know that you got to get going here. You have other uh, other plans as well going on. So thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. We know next time we see you, it's going to be bigger and better things in your career. I've worked with I hope you. So. Uh, people, a lot of people probably don't know that we did work together yeah. uh, briefly for a time. Yeah, apparently best friends, but work friends really. <laughs> yeah, even <laughs> though uh, you had my number as somebody else's in your phone. Um, did I really? You had me. <laughs> I don't know if you'll remember this. You had my my number saved as Warren Woods. Oh, basically no. the same people, same person. Oh, and really. They both hate trains. They both hate trains. They both. And hate that's trains. true. And I hate trains too. So this is it comes full I circle. Sent, I sent you a text one time, and you were like, "Who is this?" Because this was after Woods had <gasps> passed away, unfortunately. No. Yeah. No. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that all worked Does, out. Wait, but. yeah, it must have been something where, yeah, that's strange. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Well, you know what? I always love a good Ward Wood story. So, hey, let's uh, let's keep that going because he's a wonderful bright light that we missed you. Oh, I so. could talk for hours about Warren Woods. Man, oh, I miss that man. So yeah. He doesn't care about your fantasy team. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's why every single monday when uh he'd show up uh to, to the green zone be like woodsy you see how many yards this guy got and he's like i don't care yeah don't care <laughs> love love lady gaga and love yeah. like there's so many great things about him yeah it was wonderful uh, well daniela thanks for joining us uh best of luck in the future going forward uh amy says hello and best hey. of luck as well thanks and tell penny and winston i say hi 
<laughs> I think they're sleeping right now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate this. All right. Take care, Danielle. Daniela Ponticelli uh, joining us here on the Pivots podcast. Um, so there's your uh, Churchill, Bru Ch or, sorry, opening kickoff presented by Kathy Festion of Royal LePage Regina Realty. Let's jump to our Churchill company, Churchill Brewing Company odds and end zones. And uh, okay, so we got our head coach update already. It's uh, maybe <laughs> Scott M. Or is that too yeah. obvious? Uh, um, uh, S. Milanovic. S. Milanovic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, obviously nothing now. Maybe they were, uh, I mean, great cup week. The whole idea is that nothing, nothing comes out. broken. Nothing yeah. No the, news. The it's Chris all about Jones the rule. game itself. <laughs> and uh, Chris Jones kind of ruined that uh, a couple of years ago when he uh, became the Riders head coach and GM. Um, took all the luster away from great cup week. Um, but how long do you guys now give the team to find their new guy? We talked to Danielle about culture. We talked to Jeff Fairholm about culture and that needs to start right away. And you got to start evaluating free agents and who you're going to throw money at and who you're not going to throw money at. And you, you want to get a coach's input on that. So how long can this team go without a head coach now? I think a you move after, on within uh... the next week or two. I don't think you go any farther than that. Uh, you got to get in so you can get those bonus. Any, any money left over on the salary cap, you need to spend on bonuses. And you want that coach's input. I guarantee you they've already interviewed half a dozen guys that they are thinking about. And, you know, maybe there's an Argos coach or, you know, there's a couple more that might be coming down the pipelines. But they they know their top three. They knew their top three going into this. It's just a matter of waiting for the great cap. Make sure everybody's out. You cross, cross all your T's, dot your I's, and then announced the Scott Milanovic press conference and we all move on. Like, and then the air no podcast we all know, up, fine. We all know it's going to be Scott. Like there's yeah. no there's no way it's not, right? As long as he's not announced as the head coach in in in, in uh, Hamilton, which he's not going to be. He's, where else is he going to go? Who else are we going to go for in this type of situation? Yeah. Like it's, we, we joked with Daniela that whole time, but it's not really that much of a joke. It's it's the clear, clear cut favorite. If there were betting odds on head coaching choices in the uh, CFL, which I'm sure there probably are somewhere on futures, he'd be an odds on favorite. So, yeah, I don't see how they can get to the end of the month without a head coach announced. Like, yeah, after the Grey Cup, there's probably going to be you can kick the tires on Buck Pierce if he's interested. But other than that, I don't know what you, what you're going to do. Because I, unless you want to go no Noel Thorpe out of Montreal, but I don't know who you want to hire from Moss's staff. I, yeah, it's they got to have someone in in place by the end of the month. All right, well, uh, Grey Cup week, the Grey Cup State of the League address was on Tuesday. Normally, that's later in the week when the media and fans and show fans up. Fans are there. Um, he is Randy Ambrose is going to do a fan address later on this week on the 17th um my birthday but uh well, nobody cares well now now the people watching this and listening do <laughs> no uh, they, know, they don't Greg. care <laughs> <laughs> they, okay fine <laughs> um listen i didn't get what i wanted for for my birthday um i said what i wanted on this show i didn't get it um well not till a few months later so well, Steve just had his birthday, and he's getting a Chris Trevler interview coming up shortly. So, well, that's if, uh, yeah, family friendly show. It's a family friendly show. <laughs> family friendly show. <laughs> um, but the my main takeaway is from this. I mean, I always take this state of the league address with a grain of salt because it's always sunshine and lollipops. Everything around the league is great. Blah blah blah. We're close to getting a tenth team. We need to do it. Blah blah blah. We're talking to a real solid owner, blah, blah, blah. Well, the biggest takeaway to me in this was that uh, we're getting back to a balanced schedule um, in 2024 with uh, no time. Thank going back God. to riders will host everybody. They'll play in every stadium this year. Um, and it's just, it makes so much sense. Um, and, and the way that Randy Ambrosi, uh, somebody asked him about Bo Levi Mitchell, 
not being able to go to Calgary and he's, he brought up just a scheduling snafu and that just, it was a scheduling conflict. And no, there is no scheduling conflict. This is the CFL. Come on guys. There's only nine teams. You can make it work. So the fact that we're going back to the balanced schedule in 2024 is a good thing. I like it. And I think we all agree on that. Absolutely. The yep. fact that we didn't have the Cody Fajardo returns to Saskatchewan or Bo Levi back to Calgary was honestly an embarrassment for the league. Those are two easy to market games that they just threw out the window. Now I realize you know, it wasn't necessarily a possibility after the after the fact, but there there's nine teams. How we didn't have that home and home series made no sense to me. This isn't the NFL where you have to plan around thirty teams or thirty two teams. It's frustrating. I'm glad that they uh, they saw the the light at the end of the tunnel and made the right choice. And don't get me wrong, I kind of understand the impetus of the home schedule, like the more West and East Division schedules, because travel, no one knew what was going to happen after COVID. There's money to be kind of recouped as best they can, taking down travel. But at some point, it makes more sense for both competitive wise and for the fans to have every team in every stadium. They, they all fly charter. I don't buy the whole travel thing. I think it was Eddie Steele that brought that up. They fly charter. They're fine. Um, they can they can go wherever. Um, another thing, and, and we talk about marketing, and it was Toronto, BC, and Montreal, all up in revenue this year, I think was, uh, was a very good thing for this league. Um, we talked to Danielle and, you know, 26,500 at BMO Field for the East Final. Uh, shame they didn't get a good competitive game um, because that would have helped draw them on to next year as well. But hopefully that trickles through. Montreal's attendance was up. BC had 30,000 for the uh, West semifinal. Um, in the three biggest markets, that's where they were having the issues and they showed growth. And I think that's ultimately that's great for the league, even though you know we're seeing issues here in Saskatchewan and Calgary and Edmonton. I think with teams winning that'll obviously bring it back but seeing these three teams do well is just great for the league especially montreal like the entire province of quebec rightly or wrongly follows montreal montreal with those bad years attendance was down rds viewership was down montreal with a competitive team is great for the league and you can tell by the uh, ratings this week in the Alouettes Argos game. Well, and that's just it. And you look at the, we, we talked about it before that huge increase in attendance in Toronto. And it was a massive increase through the year leading up to a near sellout at the East final only speaks to good things for this league. This league will only go as far as a strong fan base in Toronto will take them. That's where the money is. People, people at TSN, they don't care how many people in Saskatchewan watch football games. They want to attract Toronto, Montreal, BC. You get those three markets, and you you're looking at ten times the the viewership numbers that Saskatchewan could bring in. It it's a no brainer. It's it all comes down to money. You get those three fan bases to continue to grow, and this league will grow right along with them. And I'm all for it. And Saturday playoff games sound like they're here to stay. Sounds like it's locked in. I like it. I love the Saturday games. I know. Steve, I don't hate it. Kind of rolling your eyes. I don't want to see the Grey Cup on sun on Saturday, but I actually don't mind the Saturday playoff, East Final, East Semi, whatever. But taking away that extra day at Grey Cup would be a huge mistake. I hope the league never does it. No, that like I should clarify that doesn't include the yeah. the Grey Cup game itself. Yeah. It's just the the semifinals and the finals will be on Saturdays. They, if they keep my, it that way, that's an okay choice in my books. It's a party night. You get you're not competing with the NFL. You're just you're you're it. You have college football, but that's that's it. I'm all for it. I guess. Well, my only problem is, and you're I, when you say college football, you obviously mean NCAA from a junior slash U sports level you're wiping out the playoffs fortunately most uh um pfc finals or playoff games are on sundays 
Uh, they moved back to Sundays, but all the U Sports playoff games are on Saturdays at the same time as your East and West finals and your semifinals. So unfortunately, it looks like the CFL is kind of stepping on a little guy on this one, but they got to protect their own, I guess. I'd love to see the day where the CFL and U Sports work together again and can market each other, or more the CFL markets U Sports the way they can. Obviously, I don't think you're going to see the Vanier Cup and Grey Cup held. Oh, they can't uh, market the them. Market they can barely market themselves. How can they market the U Sports? <laughs> well, it's got to keep Toronto growing. Get that money in there. They'll find a way. But I don't. I don't mind the games on Saturdays. It was different. Um, and junior football, Saskatoon Hilltops, of course, winning their 23rd national title. Greg, you knew I was going to no! um, CJFL final against uh, the West Shore Rebels, beating them 17. I said they would win, but I didn't want yeah. it. I want to put. I want to say that I said they would win, but I didn't want to see it. So congratulations, uh, Sarge and company, with the Toppers uh, winning their 23rd national title. Maybe, maybe I know people have. I don't know if jokingly said a, said his name out, but Tom Sargent no as uh, coach of the Riders. No I mean, no way that'll never happen. Ain't but no way. ain't no way. Bring him in for a talk just to see. Hey, what what makes you so successful? And then just kind of pick from there and go from there. As many NCAA head coaches moving on to the NFL have proven, there's a difference between teach uh, coaching pro players and coaching young men. Yes. And there's a reason why the best NCAA coaches can't make it in the NFL. Yep. Um, that, okay. We were talking that's about, what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> we were talking about revenue. Interestingly enough, after the uh, Randy Ambrosi uh, state of the league address, the CFLPA has their own address. Um, and the one thing that I saw from that was executive director, Brian Ramsey saying the league still hasn't provided financials to them from the 2022 season, which is required for the new revenue sharing that's in the CBA. So as sunshine and lollipoppy, as the CFL will say that this season was, there's still some stuff behind the scenes going on that isn't so rainbows and puppies and everything. Um, they're still, it's still CFL versus CFLPA. Or, so I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see what comes of this later on. It's always going to be adversarial between the two. One side's not going to trust the other. That's just the way it is. Uh, I'm hoping the CFL, these guys have, hey, our, our CEO is the former CFO. The guy knows how to hide money if he wants to. Like these teams aren't dumb. They're, they're going to, minimize the amount they're sharing and keep the biggest piece of the pie they can. It's just a matter of why it's taken so long to get the 2022 financials out. And to me, that is shady pool. That's not good to see. All right. Well, great cup week, great cup game itself. As much as I actually really love great cup week when I'm there more than I enjoy the game. Usually um, great cup week is, is just a, it's a wild ride, uh, for anybody that's gone, they know all about it for, if you haven't gone, go to a great cup and, uh, have a blast. Cause that's exactly what it is. But the game itself, Montreal, Winnipeg, Cody Fajardo versus Zach Kalaros and Bella 2019 rider quarterbacks. Yeah. Can we um, stop that? <laughs> The oh minute okay, Lord. here's the thing. The minute Montreal beat um Toronto. Uh Toronto, I knew what we were in for. Because it didn't matter at that point who won the West. It was going oh, to Vernon. be yep. oh, it, it was going to be, oh, JO let go of all these quarterbacks. I'm like, oh, here we go again. Like it didn't matter. The number of times I've seen that over the last what three days now, and the number of times we're gonna continue to see it over the next four as if both of these decisions weren't the right choice for the player and the team. There was no way we were keeping Zach once Cody took off. And there was no way we were keeping Cody once the end of last season happened. There was too much animosity there. There was no choice. This whole former Ryder quarterbacks as if J.O. made bad decisions, and he's made some, is getting old. And I know... 
we're going to hear it nonstop. And it, if Cody wins, it's going to be tenfold. And I hope he does. Like you, I'm an agent of chaos. And that was that would be the ultimate. We'd, we'd have stuff to talk about for the next six months until this. But even starts. I'm not even an agent of chaos. I just want Cody to win because he's a solid. I almost swore. Solid dude. <laughs> The, oh, absolutely. The guy, the guy, like I said several times on this podcast, he wanted so much to be the star player of this team. He wanted to win a great cup on this team. He wanted to be quarterback one so bad that he he wanted to be loved by this community that he signed up with some rinky dink podcast to do t shirts for charity and did a lot of good in this community. So I I want Cody to win. Oh, absolutely. And and once again, Zach Caleros would not be Winnipeg Blue Bomber if Matt Nichols could actually not get hurt. If Matt Nichols did not get hurt, Zach Caleros is probably still an Argo. I'm just waiting for the day when the Bombers fans boo Zach Caleros during a cancer PSA. It, it was a bullying PSA. I don't know. I, apparently, I got the PSA wrong. Either way, they booed him. I don't care. But it's just, yeah, like... It's not former rider quarterback versus former rider quarterback. Like it's D- despite what every media outlet will tell you. <laughs> yes. Um, what is your guys' excitement level for this game out of the potential games that we could have had this week? Uh, where's your excitement level for this one? Non-existent. I don't want to see be, Winnipeg win another one. I'd be more excited for VA versus like BC versus uh, Montreal or even BC versus Toronto. Um. Yeah, I'm hoping for Montreal win. If if the Bombers get up early, I might stick around for halftime and then shut it off. Because I don't want to see Winnipeg win another one. I I've already seen too many Bombers fans mentioning that damn D word again, and I'm I'm done with the dynasty talk. You lost last year. You got to start fresh. Don't three and four is three and five yeah. is not a dynasty. Yeah. Nope, three and five years is not a dynasty. They you're had a really COVID year that, off. You're going to hold that 2020 year against them. Anything I can to stop this dynasty talk, I will That's do. Fair. Because you know what? All of these fans forget that they had a 30-year stretch beforehand where they sucked. They were the lovable losers. They were the riders of the 89 to 07. Now they're the buttholes of the CFL fan base because they're just... They're, they're rubbing it in everybody's face. And I mean... Let's not act like Ryder Nation wouldn't do the exact same thing. I said this <laughs> earlier. They're, they are the New England Patriots. They're playing the woe is us card. Everybody hates us. Well, yeah, because you're winning. But they No, no, no. Like, every, every, everyone, hate, everyone, everyone hates the fans. Everyone hates the fans, but the refs call everything for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're taking it so personally, and that's exactly what New England Patriots fans did uh, for hey! 20 years. You still take it personally. Oh, just because we're better than you guys. <laughs> Mac you Jones. Oh, my my pain. <laughs> Your pain. Oh, do you know any uh, Ryder fans that are Buffalo Bills fans right now? Check on them. <laughs> Check on them. The PTSD oh, the, was the real. The PTSD would be just bad. Oh, my goodness. I'm a Denver Broncos fan. I stayed up and watched that game. I started laughing at the end when the, there was the too many, <laughs> too many men penalty against Buffalo on a Denver missed field goal, Denver kicks the field goal after on the penalty uh, to win the game. And I started laughing and I was like, 14 years later, I get it. I really well, understand how all the other eight fan bases felt. This is hilarious. <laughs> this is really, and it was really to the day funny. too, wasn't it? It was to the day. No. Was it? No. Cause I the great was it, been it, or one day apart. One year. No. no. It was the like great No. Yeah. Was it? You're, you're two weeks. Yeah, like, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm ahead of schedule. I'm ahead of schedule. You're right. But yeah. like, uh, yeah. Um, so if you know any Bills fans that are Ryder fans as well, check on them because they're not oh, doing the okay. I thought to the day is because they had the replay of it on uh, the day oh, before. Yeah, thanks a lot, TSN, too. Like, geez. Yeah. They do that every, C- every Grey Cup week. They play the... That game was horrid. I don't know why that game gets replayed because that was... I know why. The epitome of bad I'm well football. aware why that game gets replayed. Yeah, I want to you know watch what? the last just... two minutes of the Denver Broncos game. That's why yeah, people want to play the highlights. <laughs> Nobody wants to watch the first 58 minutes of the 09 Grey Cup. Ryder fans the don't because we don't want to see the end. And nobody wants to see it from the other fan bases because the Riders were doing good. <laughs> like, 
stop playing. They won't. I realize we're going to have this discussion just like Chris Berman talking about the CFL again. What? Like Chris Berman talked to CFL? That never happens. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. It's 30 for, years. 30 years, yeah. It, it, guess what? He's going to do it again on Monday. And guess what? Yeah, People are going to tweet like it's the first damn thing all over again. Yeah. <laughs> Famous oh. bummer fan, Chris Berman. Yep. All right. So this game, Montreal, Winnipeg. Who wins and why? Oh, should we even what the the spread is? What it start out as six and a half for Winnipeg. It's seven and a half now. It's now it's like now. Yeah, eight and a half. Like eight eight. Eight yeah. And a half. This, I mean, to me, this game can go one of three ways. Winnipeg will it'll be a close game because Montreal's defense will come to play, and Fajardo will keep it close, which. Generally speaking, he seems to do against Winnipeg. And then Winnipeg will win a close game at the end. They'll get a turnover, a touchdown or something. If Montreal wins, it's going to be a close game. That's option two. There's no way that they're going to blow them out. To me, the most likely scenario is that it's a Winnipeg blowout. I hope that's not the case. I don't want that. I don't want Winnipeg to win at all. But that I definitely don't want them to win in a route. Um, because that's just no fun for anybody. Here's so I have to go back and look. I should should have done some prep on this, but Winnipeg came out fairly heavy favorites against the Argos last year, and the Argos kept it close. I think with when it, with uh, Montreal's defense, especially with the additions of Lemon and Sankey, who are playing absolutely amazing football right now, unreal, and, yep. and Decois, like. I and possibility of uh, shown not playing. He didn't practice today. He's not in a walking boot, but he might he might be dinged up. And yes, they still have really good receivers outside of him. I think Montreal's defense is going to absolutely drive them nuts. The X factor, of course, though, is uh, Olivier. If they can get him rolling, it's it might be a long day for Montreal. But I think Montreal is going to keep it tight. I actually have fairly good hopes on Montreal on this game. You know, the the one big thing for for my, in Montreal's favor is uh, at a big hill missing likely missing this week. They're they're not ruling him out yet, but he's not playing. He's, he's he ain't out. playing. And that's a very playing. clear you know, Achilles and that's, injury. That's a that's a great news or that's great news for both the Montreal Alouettes offense as a whole and whoever their backup quarterback is on quarterback sneaks. Because Lord knows we don't need Adam Big Hill submarining in there again. How he's only ever gotten what one fine in his career for that? Uh, it, it's called it Wiggaming. Now? It's yeah. Wiggaming. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Anyways, I digress. I think that's a big key for Montreal getting into the or keeping in tight this game. They still got a solid defense. Their defensive line is, in my opinion, second to none in the CFL, though. Montreal with Sean Lemon is, you know, they're making a name for themselves too. If you would have asked me on Sunday morning, I would have said it's a 25 point blowout and we're watching Winnipeg lift it for the third time. I'm not so sure anymore. I'm with you guys. I think we get a tight football game and I'm going to pick Winnipeg only for one reason, because I am 0-4 in the playoffs so far this year. For the greater good. So For the you're welcome, good. Rider Nation, and the rest of the CFL family. This will be the only time I ever pick Winnipeg to do anything. But go, Cody. Greg, who wins? Not not spread, uh, straight up, who wins? Uh, I... Oof. I, I think Montreal's going to cover like that. That the, the more that point spread grows, I think Montreal is a safe bet. I I I believe in Cody Fajardo. I really do. I think he might have his best game as in the CFL, and he's had some. He had some good ones early with the Riders. He'll need but it once. It, he'll need it. He'll definitely need it. But that, like I said, Sankey and Dequa and my good friend Sean Lemon. Um, <laughs> they are playing very, very well right now. And I think they are going to make a long day for Zach Claros. Because I did mention it before. 
Uh, when we talked about them hiding Claros, I don't think Claros is as good as everyone thought he was. I don't think he was the MOP. I don't. Everyone said he should have been Winnipeg's MOP, and I don't agree. Um, I think he's slowly losing a step, and I think Montreal's defense is going to be a long day for him. That's why Olivier is going to be the key for them to win. Yeah, that that offense goes entirely around how successful Brady Oliver is. If he if he is who he has been most of the season. Montreal is in for a nightmare, but if they can contain him, especially if Schoen is missing uh, and they're already hurting people, there's possibilities there. I have Winnipeg winning the game. I don't think they cover eight and a half if that's what it ends at. I think it's a seven point game, but I think Winnipeg wins. Um, who's your Grey Cup MVP? Brady yeah, if, yeah, if uh, Winnipeg wins, Olivia, 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 yeah, Brady both times. If Montreal wins, it's going to be on the defensive side, Dequois and Lemon. Steve, it's Brady. It's Brady for me on the uh, on the Winnipeg side. There's no question there. Um, I, it's hard to argue with either Dequois or Lemon. Uh, but I'm going to go and say if 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 Montreal wins, sorry, it's going to be Cody Fajardo and uh, Dequa. Um, I actually didn't come prepared by picking one for both teams. I just picked one uh, who I think is going to win. So I picked Winnipeg. Um, I'm going with Zach Caleros as MVP of the game. Um, but if Montreal does win it'll have to be Cody Fajardo and granted they, they always skew things towards quarterbacks anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I try roll. avoiding the quarterback whenever I can. <laughs> um, what about most outstanding Canadian? To me, it's a lock for um, on at least for, for the bombers. I know you guys are going to say Brady, uh, Oliveira. I'm going to say Nick Dembski. I think he's uh He's the one for the Bombers. Um, yeah. On Montreal side, you guys are probably going to go with like and Mark Antoine de Croix on defense. That's yeah. my guess, anyway. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off the off the board a little bit and go with uh, Tyson Philpot. I was going to say Philpot would be my second choice. If it's not de Croix, I would go with Philpot. Uh, he he had a quiet, like quiet, very good season. So. Dequois ended or Hamilton season. He effectively ended early Toronto season. If Montreal wants to succeed, he's going to have to do it again. He is the key to that defense. Him and Sean Lemon. That's why when we said Montreal, I said Dequois. Uh, he was my pick for uh, most outstanding Canadian. And I mean, if you pick Oliveira for most outstanding player, you kind of have to pick him for most outstanding Canadian. Although it'd be very CFL to give somebody else most outstanding Canadian. Oh. They for sure would absolutely. Be, it'd be kind of kind of neat to see, but Dembski, God, I hope not. That's just, that would just be the icing on the cake of uh, of players we let get away. And plus, Greg would absolutely hate that. I think. A thousand, hey, a thousand yard receiver, Nick Dembski. Yep. <laughs> bo, bo bloody well, I time. Just hope, I just hope it's a really good game because I do not want it to end up how I really think it's going to end up. Uh, so. Hey, at least hey, at least we can look forward to halftime. I'm to say, what's the halftime. song that Green Day opens with? What do they open with? Yeah, I think it's "Welcome to Paradise." That's, that's the that's only song that uh, TSN's been playing during their their promo for it the whole time. So I think they open with that. They'll probably play "American Idiot." Um, I'm sure they'll play uh, "Wake Me Up When September Ends" to end this end the show for some reason. They might play their new song. Um, and the bell goes off the air. Yeah. Um, yeah, they <laughs> might. Yeah. They'll play, they'll play good riddance. And then uh, TSN no longer exists. Yeah. That'd be uh, very, very on brand for, for Bell Media. I, I think, actually, I, I my, my my outlier to start would be Brains too. I think it's a good hard riff to get things going. But yeah, Welcome to Paris is good too. All I know is I'm excited I'll actually be home for the entire Grey Cup this year. 
is rare with, with floor hockey on Sunday. So I get to actually see the halftime show. Just I'm play just delightful. I can't believe I'm excited for a halftime show for the CFL in a long time. Like this <laughs> is like I'm legit like I cannot wait for the halftime show. Just play the first 10 songs off Dookie. I'm yeah. I'm a very happy person then. Just go up right up into she and then there you go. I, I got a I got a laugh though. They they put that um image out based on the Dookie album. Yeah. And they legit just put it on top of the Dookie album because you can see the original artist's uh, signature still on the artwork. I'm like, oh, was oh, it? That's kind of yeah, that's that's kind of a bad thing to do technically, but uh, yeah, it was, and like I was like, I hope they put it on the shirt. I'm like, uh, as a graphic artist, uh, I'm hoping they don't do that because as much as I want one, that's very bad to do. <laughs> the the real question is, does Billy Joe Armstrong? come out on dog sleds and who is flipping in an AT or in a, a sled. Why not do both? No, they have to. Billy Joe Armstrong flipping on a sled on a, on a dog sled. Yeah. That's his entrance. <laughs> those, those, yep. th- those dogs are going to be scared going over that ramp, but it's <laughs> worth it. <laughs> well, should be uh hopefully should be a good one. And uh, we'll talk about it next week and uh, look forward to, uh, Scott M or S Milanovic uh, being named Riders head coach <laughs> next week, sometime after the Grey Cup. Hopefully that uh, happens pretty quick. Um, I can't see it lasting very long. So, but that's what we'll be talking about next week on the show. That's going to do it for us this week here on the Piffles Podcast. Thanks everybody for joining us here this week. Uh, Daniela Ponticelli for joining us earlier in the show. Special thanks, of course. Uh, go out to Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina as the Pivots Podcast is brought to you by them. Special thanks, of course, to Kathy Festion of Royal LePage Regina Realty and Churchill Brewing Company for their support making this show possible. Thank you, uh, everybody downloading the show, listening, watching on YouTube, watching on Sass Tell Max. We saw kind of what the numbers were on Sass Tell Max. Blown away uh, you by, guys are by how many people Why? are watching. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying uh, what you see and we'll have more coming up at least, in the at least what you listen to i don't know if they enjoy what they see yeah i got nothing steve with his nice head nice nice yes. nice, nice round head steve thank you thank you <laughs> this is ghost behind your mind by tyler gilbert the ghost-